Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm doing the first in a new series that I'm calling First Volume. Cause I suck at naming things, so just call it what it is, you know? I've been wanting to start a new series for a while now that allows me to talk about comics that are still running, as opposed to completely finished series that I look at for all my other videos. Seeing as today is Juneteenth, and considering the worldwide protests that have been going on for a while now in memory of so many who have been so unjustly murdered, particularly my fellow former Houstonian George Floyd, I really wanted to cover something still being made so that people might actually benefit from some promotion. So I decided to take a look at the series Excellent from Skyward Slash Image Comics, a comic written entirely by people of color. Which I have to say, it's pretty unusual in the industry, from what I've seen, to have a comic created entirely by minorities. Even Maneaters, which was specifically intended to be created by all women, had a token dude on the team. So let's take a look at this creative team. First up is writer Brandon Thomas, who has done various work for DC and Marvel, including apparently some work on the X-Force Shatterstar series under Rob Liefeld, so that's kinda cool. He also wrote the sci-fi series Horizon, and the just-finished series Hardcore Reloaded, the last issue of which came out two days ago. Seriously, you could probably run to the comic store right now and get the final issue. The artist on the series is Kari Randolph, who has done work on various indie comics, including a Spawn comic, a summer special for Bitter Root, and a series called Tech Jacket. He's also worked for DC, like his work on the We Are Robin series that ran shortly before the DC Rebirth, and Marvel, like in the Marvel Now series, Mosaic. On colors is Emilio Lopez, who seems to be more of a freelance artist, working in things like animation, and the most recent comic book I can find that he's worked on was a comic book adaptation of one of the Coheed and Cambria albums, written by its frontman Claudio Sanchez and drawn by Rax Morales. Yeah, that's a thing. That's really a thing. Last, but certainly not least, is letterer Darren Bennett, who has been nominated for an Eisner for his lettering work, which includes a comic book for The Dark Crystal, and work on a series called Hacktivist, which was published by Boom Studios, and, believe it or not, was created by actress Alyssa Milano. Yeah, that's also a thing. Comic books. In 2019, this diverse group began releasing Excellence, a comic about a secret order of wizards in the modern world. The comic is still running, though I think the issues that will comprise Volume 2 have been delayed due to the Diamond Comic Distributor's shutdown following the COVID outbreak. The first volume follows Spencer Dales from birth through about age 17, with a couple flashes forward to age 19 where things seem to have gone really south for him. Like Barbara Gordon, he seems to have an eidetic memory, so he can remember all the events of his life with perfect recollection. The Dale family seems to be of some importance in the wizarding world, one of ten important families making up something called the Tenth, the ten original families that make up the wizarding hierarchy of the ages. This makes Spencer a bit like wizard nobility, so a lot is expected of him, and the pressure to perform is high. Which is why his father is so disappointed in him not showing magical ability early on, even going so far as to blame the mother. Not cool, Pompadell. To help him hone his magical abilities, Spencer works with Aaron Mills, who serves as both sort of a brother and rival for Spence. But I'm not really honestly clear on why Aaron is even there. Raymond Dale, Spencer's dad, treats Aaron like the son he always wanted, and Aaron was around before he began training Spencer, but again, why? We learn almost nothing at any point about who Aaron is, why he's there, what he wants from life, or anything. He's basically the second most major character of the story, but I can't really tell you anything about him other than that he fills the role of the good son, obeying all of Raymond's orders while Spencer goes around breaking them. Spencer is all rage. He rages at his father for bowing to the authority of the Aegis. He rages at Eren for being the more beloved son. He rages at magic for not being enough to heal his grandmother when she falls sick. He rages at the system for not working like he wants it to. All this rage leads him to break into a magic vault at the Aegis in order to find something that will help his grandmother. He gets caught and stopped though by the Overseer, who is basically like the magic police. He manifests as just all bright white light, I think because magic seems to change color based on how powerful the user is, with the strongest level being pure white. 
The Overseer initially takes Spencer's magic away as a warning of what will happen if Spencer doesn't fall in line. He does restore it, but Spencer is basically forced into public service at that point, policing other wizards who are selling quicks or phony wands that apparently work like magical crack, even with the addiction and side effects. Is that just regular crack then? The point of this wizarding society isn't just to have a bunch of fighting amongst themselves though. Instead, it seems the goal is to work invisibly behind the scenes to make life better for regular people considered worthy of achieving great things. And those regular people seem to be white people. I'm not really positive on that, but that's definitely what it looks like from what we see. We only get two glimpses into how this process actually works. First, there's in Spencer's wizarding trials, which seems to be an important part of going from just a regular wizard into what's called a patron. Here, he's given this target and told he needs to ensure that this guy proposes to his girlfriend, which he's beginning to chicken out on. Typical. Spencer ensures the proposal by the apparently unconventional method of casting without a wand, using some kind of earthquake spell to send the woman nearly falling to her doom. The unnamed man, with some magical assistance from Aaron, is able to save her, and with newly instilled fear about potentially losing her, is now definitely going to propose. This is considered a success with the life improvement achieved for the pair without anyone even knowing about the magical intervention. Although, like, nobody thinks it's weird that there was some kind of earthquake on the, what, 50th floor of this building or whatever? Okay then, our second indication of how this process works is when we see Aaron in the middle of observing the life of someone chosen as worthy, and he's intended to boost her life by ensuring she gets together with this angry looking guy. Aaron makes the mistake of falling in love with his charge though, dangerously exposing the wizarding world. As one last mission on his public service, Spencer is said to bring Aaron in, and when they cross wands, they end up grabbing each other's wands, which causes them to get each other's memories. I really like this bit because it's the one time in the series we get to take a look outside of the narrow focus we've had on Spencer and see things from someone else's perspective. Mainly it just involves a heavy focus on the chick that he fell for though, and some heavy, heavy breathing. Awkward. Aaron gets jailed for his crime, though looks like it's a pretty cushy jail. Those the 10th family connections working out in his favor I guess. Aaron repeatedly refuses to see Spencer when he comes to visit, but it seems like it's all part of a trick, because Spencer is actually leaving a magical double behind to sneak into the prison and reach Aaron's cell, where they start working on plans for their growing rebellion. I think. As with everything else, I'm pretty unclear on exactly what is supposed to be happening here. And that's all we really see in the first volume, beyond some teasers of some fight between Spencer and the Overseer coming in the future. While it's nice to know what's coming, I would have liked to know more about what has already happened. I'm confused on just about every single aspect of every single part of every single issue. What I've managed to learn about the world of this comic, I've mostly just managed to infer from the intentional similarities to our world or what small threads of information they've actually given out. I think this comic has great potential for world building, and if they take the opportunity to really do that in the coming issues, then I think I could really enjoy this series. Unfortunately, it seems like the comic's extremely narrow focus on just what is immediately happening to Spencer hurts my hope that we'll get that from this series. I get that Spencer is raging against the system, but I don't get anything about what the system is that he's raging against. I don't really understand what the Aegis is, what its real goal is, what it is wizards are supposed to be doing for the most part, how it reflects on society, or how aware or not aware normal people are of the existence of any of the wizarding world. I don't even know who constitutes normal people. Are all wizards black? Are all black people wizards? Are there any white wizards? Do other people of color participate in some aspect of this society? The comic's written much like you would expect something to be written by someone picking up a long running series in a well established universe, like Batman or Spider Man. Which would work if you were writing Batman or Spider-Man because you could trust that we know the universe already. But we don't know this universe and we're going to really need to understand it very well if the creative team wants us to sympathize with their main character in his fight against it. Right now, with the way they present it, it's kind of hard to not take Raymond Dale's side and see Spencer as acting as kind of a brat, which I don't think is their goal. But hey, at least the art is fantastic, seriously. 
I could keep reading this comic just to continue looking at the art. So I'm going to go ahead and repurpose my ranking meter as an anticipation meter and give it an anticipation level of high. If they could really dive into the world building, I think the series could be phenomenal. I just wish I could have more faith that this series would do as much of that as I'd hope. Thanks everybody for watching! What did you all think of this new series? Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to do more videos like this! I'd probably keep doing my regular breakdowns on Fridays and do these first volume ones on other days of the week when I have time. It'll probably be a while before I do another one though, so for now, for next week, I'll be back to another full series breakdown. So make sure to stick around for that, and I hope to see you then, right here, in the Comic Cave.